We have a brand new State of the Race episode, audio only, available for you first thing tomorrow morning. We'll get you all prepared for what might happen in South Carolina and what mean, what it means going forward. It's under the Stu Does America podcast stream. Go to wherever you get your podcasts, search for Stu Does America, subscribe there, and you'll get not only uh, this wonderful show, but also the bonus pod, State of the Race, which we're going to be updating throughout the election campaign with everything you need to know from the polls to the campaign inside stuff. All that stuff is going to be right there. Also, don't forget to support us on YouTube. Just head to youtube.com slash America. You can subscribe, like our videos, and hit the bell for notifications. Steve Krakauer is going to be here with some thoughts on the media's election coverage this year. I've got an exclusive look into some private correspondence between Joe and Hunter Biden that you don't want to miss. But we start by doing Jim Biden. Yes, Stu does Jim Biden, a wonderful title for an episode of a show. I will say it's different than if Stu did Frank Biden, because if Stu did Frank Biden, we'd be talking about things that are happening on Grindr. Or actually, <laughs> I should point out what he had was, uh, what was it? Guyswithiphones.com. Guy- if you don't know, uh, Frank Biden had some pictures on guys with iPhone iPhones.com. And it's important to understand they do not want anyone from the Android platform on this website. It's only if you have an iPhone. No green bubbles when you're getting men to hook up with you in bathrooms or whatever they're doing on guys with iPhones.com, as if I don't know. Um, Okay, let me show you uh, actually the brother I am talking about. It is Jim Biden. There they are. Oh, it's Joseph Robinette and Jim Biden. And I let me look at that picture closely for a second. And I'm going to be honest, just look closely, look at those two faces, and I'll try to walk you through this if you're on podcast, but I think you'll get the point I'm making. If you were to look at these two people, which one would you say you thought was Hunter Biden's dad? Just look at those two people. You might say, what, wait, what accusation are you making here? And I'm making no accusation whatsoever. What I am pointing out is this is a family that is known for brothers hooking up with the spouses of brothers. I'm just saying, look, do I have any factual basis for this? No, but what I do have are eyeballs. And I'm telling you that uh, that Jim Biden looks an awful lot like Hunter. Just throwing it out there. Why not? It wouldn't be the worst thing in the Biden family. Now, of course, James Biden is an interesting figure in the big Biden scandals over the past few years. (laughs) Hope. You know it's going to get aggregated and someone's going to pick up the fact that I'm saying that Hunter Biden's dad is actually Jim Biden. And honestly, I'm kind of fine with it. It's funny. Okay, so um, uh, Jim Biden is like, we know Hunter, right? Hunter, what is he doing? He's doing cocaine off hookers. He's, uh, he's you know, buying drugs. He's hooking up with tons and tons of women. He's texting naked pictures of himself all over the place. Not with guys with iPhones.com, but instead on his own personal devices. And then he's leaving them at computer repair shops. Like, everything about the story is so insane that if you were to put it in a movie, you would not believe it, right? Like, it's, he's an incredible character, at this late, uh, at, at this high level of politics, Jim Biden, another Biden in the family, is equally as corrupt, in my view. He's just also boring. He's doing the boring parts of the corruption, and that's something for you to know. Now he's been testifying here, and of course, you know the media is very much on his uh, defense now. James Biden testifies: brother had no direct or indirect financial interest. In his business ventures, he said, I have a 50 year old career, a 50 year career in a variety of business ventures. Joe Biden has never had any involvement or any direct or indirect financial interest in those activities. None, James Biden said in his opening statement. James Biden, younger brother of the president, who said in his opening statement Wednesday that he's always kept my professional life separate from our close personal relationship, citing the elder Biden's personal integrity and character. I have never asked my brother to take any official action on behalf of me, my business associates, or anyone else. He also said he never relied on his status as Joe Biden's brother when involved in various business ventures. Those who have said or thought otherwise were either mistaken, ill-informed, or flat-out lying, the younger Biden said. Now, this is basically being treated as, well, case closed. He said he didn't do this. Now, we have extensive evidence that shows that he did do this, that he did include Joe Biden in these business dealings. I'm going to go through you, uh, through uh, some of this with you here in a second. But 
First, let's get to some of the reaction to his testimony. Now, Joe Biden's brother switched up his story on the China deal after lawmakers showed him receipts, a source says. Joe Biden's younger brother, in closed door testimony, the House Oversight and Judiciary Committees, initially told his interviewers that he was not part of a business deal involving Hunter Biden and several of his associates, according to a source familiar with the interview. However, after investigators showed him an agreement that features his signature alongside those of Hunter Biden and his business partners. This is really tough stuff. James Biden then told legislators that he did not remember signing the agreement. And how many times has this happened to you? How many times you've been like, you know what? There's my signature on that document, but that definitely wasn't me. Now, maybe it's not impossible, right, that maybe Hunter forged James Biden's signature. I, I mean, that is not impossible. I mean, you know, Hunter is that bad of a character. He would do something like that. But there's more to it than that, just that. Now, let me bring it back uh, to Peter Schweizer. Peter Schweizer, of course, been on this program before. He's written many bestsellers. One of them talked a lot about the Biden family. This is before any of this stuff was really public. Like he was, uh, Peter was really one of the first guys talking about this. This is a Biden family scandal, and it involves Joe Biden. It's the way he frames the Biden uh, crime family, if you will. Um, and James Biden is a big part of that. In fact, if you go back and look at his writings, before all this was really in the public domain, Peter Schweizer said Joe Biden was the most corrupt vice president in U.S. history. And if you know your history, you know, there's been some corrupt vice presidents in this country. Uh, it's a big statement to say that. He also talked a lot about the real estate investments and, and other shady activities that related to Jim Biden. Jim Biden is like, if you think of Hunter kind of being the wild card and he's willing to do all the crazy stuff and he's kind of like, you know, constantly falling down on the job and doing all sorts of things he shouldn't. Jim Biden is a more buttoned up version. He is just as involved in, you know, whatever shady activities you might want to throw at Joe Biden, in my opinion, al allegedly. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it does, does that matter? Like a lot of times the boring scandal is the one that takes you down. And so I want to look at some of this with, uh, with Jim Biden. Now, uh, of course, Jim Biden has told lawmakers he has no documentation of the loans from the president. Now, I just want to stop here for a second. This is the second time this week we've talked about someone who claims to be lo getting loans and loaning people thousands and thousands of dollars in cash with no evidence the money was ever exchanged. This doesn't happen. I, full stop. It does not occur. The reason it occurs is when you're committing a crime, when you're trying to hide corruption. Then you're shoveling cash at each other like crazy. But like, even if someone gave you a large cash payment, which of course does happen in this country, you usually are going to throw it in your bank, right? Like, that's what happens unless you're trying to avoid taxes or you're trying to avoid a, a paper trail. Certainly, if your brother loaned you some cash, you'd throw it in the bank and you'd have documentation that it was put in the bank. Who, why wouldn't you do that? What is the, what is the possible explanation? And, and usually what the explanation is, which is hilarious, is they all sound like, you know, hardcore libertarians. Oh, I don't know the banking system. What could happen? I don't know. I mean, that, that was the, uh, what was, what's his face uh, in, in New Jersey? Um, Menendez uh, excuse. Oh, God. Well, I have got, come from Cuban descent and I'm worried the government come, might come in and take my money. Mr. Mr. Democrat that wants full control of everything you do by the centralized government. You're worried about that? Are you? Are you? I doubt it. This is uh, essentially the exact same excuse that Fonnie Willis gave earlier uh, in her testimony. And we mocked that just as hard because it's nonsense. Everyone knows when you do stuff like this, you're hiding something. Every judge knows it. Every police officer knows it. Everybody who's everybody knows it. And of course, that is the excuse from Jim Biden. Uh, there's a National Review story, five major questions lawmakers should ask Joe Biden's brother. Uh, let me go through them real quick. You should read the piece and get the answers here. But was your brother ever involved in your Chinese business dealings? Why did Joe Biden require plausible deniability? 
if he wasn't doing anything wrong. You'll notice plausible deniability in quotes there. Uh, did you make promises to AmeriCorps about Joe Biden's role with the company? If so, was Joe Biden aware of those promises? Were the checks you sent to Joe Biden really loan payments? Um, were you, uh, will you turn over the vi financial documentation to prove it? And did you mislead federal agents about the nature of your Chinese business dealings? All this is uh, in the story, and you, sh you should definitely go back and read this, but you also heard something called AmeriCorps mentioned, and that's what I want to drill down into uh, tonight, because this is a story probably most people aren't aware of, but it is just a microcosm of, of all this sort of activity that was done with perhaps the wink and a nod from the president. Maybe he might deny that, but it blows up everything I read to you from Jim Biden's opening statement in his testimony. It proves that he's lying. Again, and this is not coming from, uh, you know, I mentioned, what was it, uh, uh, National Review for one of these stories. Uh, this is not coming from National Review. This is coming from Politico, a left-wing media source that is obviously tied in strongly into D.C. Biden's brother used his name to promote a hospital chain, then it collapsed. Let me just give you some of the details of this, because this is a story that's going under the radar. Certainly the mainstream media doesn't want to talk about it. This would be a perfect platform to expose my brother's team to your protocol, Jim Biden wrote to the CEO of a Tampa area company that controlled licensing rights to an experimental cancer treatment the hospital operator wanted to offer. Could provide a great opportunity for some real exposure. The email obtained by Politico from a person close to the company documents one of the many ways in which Jim Biden invoked his brother's name and clout in the course of his work with AmeriCorps, which has since gone bankrupt, wreaking havoc in rural communities in the process. Do you remember the statement I read from Jim Biden just a couple of minutes ago where he denied there was any involvement? He never used his brother's name. There was no tie direct or indirect to the, the president. Politico has got the emails where he does it directly, talks about his brother and his, his, his ties to potentially um, the cancer thing. Now, you might know of a website called HasJoeBidenCuredCancer.com. Uh, you can go check that, and, and maybe he has. I haven't, I haven't looked at it lately, but it's always updated up to the second. HasJoeBidenCuredCancer.com. You know that this is, was a big campaign promise of Joe Biden, that he was going to cure cancer if he became president. You know that he talks about this a lot. Think about that if you're a rural health care company with a potential cancer cure. You want Joe Biden to be aware of your project because if he becomes president of the United States, you could get billions of dollars to flow to your research. Jim Biden is promising this. He is telling this company, hey, you know, I can hook you up with some access uh, to my, uh, my, uh, my brother. This is on the record. Jim Biden spoke of plans to give his brother equity in AmeriCorps. According to one former AmeriCorps executive, and install him on its board, according to a second. He also said that if AmeriCorps could find a winning business model for rural health care, his brother could promote the company in a future presidential campaign, a third former executive told Politico. Now, you might be able to go down the road and say, well, we don't know that Joe Biden knew anything about this. This is just Jim Biden using his name. To be clear, what you're saying is that you think they had a massive corruption within this family um, and they were lying to people to get millions of dollars in payments, but maybe one family member didn't know about it. So you're saying they're all, all the rest of them are criminals. Can we get to the point where we admit that, then we can move down the road a little bit more? In order to fund AmeriCorps' expansion, Jim Biden offered to secure capital from investors in the Middle East, according to the emails and executives. When the expected money did not arrive, it aggravated AmeriCorps' pre-existing financial issues. The company collapsed, leaving behind unpaid bills and neglected patients. And this is something that's a, that's a big part of this particular story, AmeriCorps. This wasn't one of these things where they stole money from some Ukrainian oil company or gas company. And like, well, hey, you know, some people got what they wanted. Some people didn't. It was typical corrupt dealing. This actually hurt people. Like this is people who were unable to get the health care they needed because of the Biden family and the way that this collapsed. They could not come up with the money. They could not come up with their promises. And that is not a pretty picture. The management failures took a human toll as hospital staff went unpaid. Services dwindled and authorities were forced to intervene. At AmeriCorps Hospital in southeastern Kentucky, ravaged by staff departures and dwindling medical supplies, a patient died of cardiac arrest 
in late 2018 after receiving substandard care, according to a Department of Health and Human Services report obtained by Politico. In addition to the accounts provided by former executives, Investor Materials described Jim Biden as an, as an advisor to his older brother. Remember, he denied having any tie to his brother in that way. And on top of Joe Biden's own previously reported encounter with the firm's CEO, at least three of Joe Biden's relatives did work with AmeriCorps. They include Jim Biden's wife, Sarah. Again, this is not normal behavior. Not typically, you know, people don't get hired as couples. And I don't know, unless it's Donnie and Marie. Like sister and brother couple. I don't remember. Anyway, um, uh, the president's son, Hunter Biden, also met with his CEO and his personal doctor, current White House physician Kevin O'Connor, joined a meeting with Jim Biden and the president of a hospital being acquired by AmeriCorps, according to a former executive in emails obtained by Politico. And remember, Kevin O'Connor, the House physician, is the guy telling you, oh, Joe Biden's totally fine. Uh, the brain's popping just like normal. Well, he had these meetings as well. Gee, I wonder what happened. On the same day, Jim Biden received a $200,000 payment from AmeriCorps. He made out a check to his brother, Joe. Huh. On the same day. The White House has said the check was for a repayment of a loan, but did not respond to questions about the circumstances of the loan, including whether Joe Biden was aware of his brother's income from the company that he said Joe was going to help with. This is crazy. Nobody would believe this story. The media, given in any other circumstance, would immediately say how fraudulent this sounds and, and, and looks. And like, I guess the good version of this story is that Jim was lying about his brother and manipulating AmeriCorps into paying him a fortune. Is that legal? Is it? Using his brother's influence, which they all say at the beginning they didn't do, We'll see if he backs off on that. Um, Jim is a lot more boring, but he's just as corrupt as some of these other family members. And it's important to remember that, you know, while he might, we don't you know, have footage of him, uh, you know, doing crack off hookers' bellies or on guyswithiphones.com, but we do have a real accusations of corruption and a guy who seems to have professionalized this practice. And I will say, show me that picture again. Do we have that picture again one more time there? There it is. There's Joe Biden and Jim Biden. Which one do you think is Hunter Biden's dad? And I asked that. I mean, it's a little bit of a, it's just an honest question. I mean, I will say, I mean, Jim looks like Hunter a little bit more than Joe does. But here's the thing. With this family, if you look at the possibility, and let's we'll throw that out as a possibility, that Jim Biden actually is the father of Hunter Biden. Let's just throw it out there as a possibility and entertain it for just for a second. The fact that Jim Biden is hooking up with his brother's wife is about the most wholesome thing that has ever happened in this family. All right, this past December, drug shortages hit a record high. Now, I don't know how much this had to do with Joe Biden and Jim Biden working together on health care projects that went up bankrupting hospitals. I'm not sure how tied that in is to this particular uh, issue, but certainly Biden as president has not exactly brought a bounty of supply chain uh, success. So as we go through this presidency, as we see all sorts of these things happening, you wonder what are the consequences. I mean, there's delays, there's treatment cancellations, there's unfortunate rationing of vital medi medications, even things like antibiotics that you'd always think that are going to be plentiful in this world. Uh, well, in Joe Biden's America, they have not been around. So what do you do about that? Could it get even worse than this? I think the answer to that is certainly yes. This is why you need the Jace case. It's a personalized emergency kit that contains five essential antibiotics that treat the most common and deadly bacterial infections. Get your own. You can then buy a gift card for your family or your loved ones. They can customize theirs. You can customize yours. Jace Case makes this really easy. It's something that you should have on hand because food and water aren't enough. Go to jacemedical.com today. J-A-S-E medical.com. Enter the code STU at checkout for your uh, discount on the order. Again, the promo code is STU at jacemedical.com. J-A-S-E medical.com. It's the Jace Case from Jace Medical. 
I am joined once again by Steve Krakauer. He's the editor of the For- uh, Fourth Watch and his book right here, Uncovered, How the Media Got Cozy with Power, Abandoned Its Principles and Lost the People is now available on paperback. I've told you before, it's a great book, especially if you want to understand the media and all the craziness that you see on the screen every single day. Uh, Steve, thanks for coming on the program. Steve, great to be back. Of course, also executive producer of Megan, Megan, Megan Kelly program. Uh, yes. I should, I, should, I should point that out as Thank well. You, yes. um, uh, let me go to the, the, the cable news landscape yeah. here to start because we have it's such an interesting time where we have the 2016 election where in my view and i think this is your view is reflected in the book there, there's a a real change in the media yes like they there was always a, a left-wing bias you know in my view but it, it was never as over until trump really came in like it almost is like when george w bush was president of the united states they would say a lot of bad things about him but with trump they really mean it oh, yeah. right? you know yeah. um so take us back to that era and, and, and take us through the transition that happens which i i view as a pretty bad transition i do too i do too you know i i went back i've just you know, recently as I'm, as I'm going back through the book and thinking of the quotes that really stood out and amy chozik a former new york times yeah. journalist uh, actually has a show coming out on hulu uh called girls on the bus uh, she had this great quote in there, and I, I think it's true. And she says that there's a new young generation of journalists that believe objectivity is akin to white supremacy. And she said it, and I, I read it back. And, wow, and what a quote it, that it's is. It's quite an admission. And I think it's true, though. And, and I think that we, we exist in a time now where the CNNs of old, the New York Timeses, and the Washington Posts, they believed that objectivity was the goal. And I think that you know we we would criticize them as you know as, as journalists on yeah. the, on the other side. They missed the oh. mark. Exactly. They they've got their biases. Oh, they're letting it seep through here. But that was always the what they strive to do. Uh, that changed. That changed because of the Trump dynamic in 2016, and I think really after 2016. I think once once he won, then it was like, well, well we cannot let that happen again. This is how, what did we do wrong here? Well, we can't just have this both sidesism and what aboutism and all of these terms that have become popularized and suddenly objectivity is wrong. And so I, I think when it comes to cable news, CNN is, you know, I, I, I say CNN is, is worse than MSNBC in a lot of ways because mm. MSNBC at least is somewhat honest about where it's coming from. CNN is trying to make the claim that they're still unbiased, that they're still objective, but they also are more than happy to lean into the, you know, hashtag resistance movement right. when, it, when it suits them. And I think when it comes to Trump, the guardrails are going completely off. There are no longer any sort of journalism ethics rules and they have to, they don't even really think about what hypocrisy, you know, what it might look like if they're covering one thing versus the other thing. No, these things are not the same and we are not going to cover them the same. And, and I think it's to the audience's detriment. Yeah, I really, I mean, and Amy Chosik is a really good journalist, really yeah. smart, but not like some conservative who you'd think being was be out there saying like, hey, like we, you know, you know go Trump. Like that's right. not, I don't think who she is. The fact that she's noticing that is is, is stunning, and, and you know you, we saw this at the New York Times, you know, with Barry Weiss's departure, and, and there's so many so many things that have happened over the past few years there that have indicated like, and I like to believe in a way that they see Trump as such a unique threat that this is a one-time thing, but I don't think it is. I, I think if DeSantis had won this primary, all of a sudden they would have seen him this same way and been viewing him. I mean, I just think they, this whole idea object, of object, objectivity is just lost at this point. I, I think you're right. I, yeah. I, I do think that it probably starts with Trump and then it kind of builds out. I, I agree. I think if Ron DeSantis would, would have somehow pulled this off, mm. he would have been the target in a lot of ways that, that Trump is as well. I do think there are some Trump elements that make him unique, mm-hmm. mainly because of the way he's as talented, frankly, if you just put it aside politics, just as an entertainer, <laughs> as, as a figure in our culture. He is just an extremely talented, unique figure. And so, you know, the, the antagonists, the other side, they, it just drives them crazy. So I, I do think he kind of, whether it's Trump derangement syndrome, I describe it in Uncovered as a Trump addiction, he has that one quality to it that it makes him a little more potent than anyone else. Yeah. But no, I, I think that's absolutely right. Look, I, I, I spent a lot of time in the book writing about the Tom Cotton op-ed in June yeah. of 2020. Mm-hmm. This was a story that was not necessarily related to Trump. This was really the George Floyd and the protests that came after it. But then then you have this uproar at the New York Times because they dared to publish a pretty benign column by a United States senator. I mean, it, it's it's insane that it caused what it did. But what you learned is that the, the rising up of the youngest members in their newsroom were able to push out the opinion editor because they he dared to publish this column. And so <laughs> it, once you see that you have that power, 
then you, the journalists that, that see that are going to just continue doing it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it goes in a way to uh, what we saw with Tucker Carlson and, and Vladimir Putin, right? Yeah. Where, like, it, it, the... The, the journalistic stance seems to be we just shouldn't hear from this guy. You know, right. I mean, Megyn Kelly, of course, famously uh, also interviewed Vladimir Putin. And even at that point, I think at least people were saying, well, of course, it's good that someone goes and talks to him. Like he's one of the world leaders in the middle of every global story on Earth. Of course, we should hear what he says. Now we're to the point like, you know, you mentioned with the Tom Cotton op ed. And I feel like so many other times that it's like. Well, what if we never hear what they say? What if we're just able to project on them what we want them to, to say? What if we project on them what we want people to believe their opinion is? Then we never have to answer for who they really are. It's, it's 100% true. And it's, it's actually one of the reasons why I do think that we would be in this position in some degree if Donald Trump didn't exist at all. Yeah. Because I, I think it really boils down to social media and the rise of social media, the decline of the gatekeepers that once had a real power. And, and suddenly, you know, now you have people who can accrue a big audience that don't require the the institutional kind of media behind them, the corporate press behind them, they can actually develop an audience. Essentially, everyone's a journalist in a lot of ways because yeah. you've, what you can build on, on X, formerly Twitter, and whatnot. And so I think it really causes massive fear by the people that were once in charge, by the gatekeepers, by the establishment. And they don't want people to have an audience and to, to be able to, to sway the masses in a way that, they, that, they, that makes them very fearful. I mean, we saw this with COVID. I think we still see see it in a lot of ways with the, the you know, the lasting effect of coronavirus and, and, and the way that that pandemic caused a, a massive shift in a censorship regime and kind of this anti-speech mm. activism that I describe in the book. So, so yeah, I think that it's, it's the way that these formerly very powerful figures are losing power. They can feel the, the sand eroding beneath their feet that they just want to shut down speech even if they're journalists. <laughs> it's terrifying. Yeah. Um, so let me look at CNN, for example, here. And, and I, you know, I think it's easy for, for probably me and you to sit here and say CNN is bad and everything they do is bad. Um, you know, we both used to work there. Yeah. Uh, so, funny. I mean, I'm not, you know, like I, I'm not inherently anti-CNN right. by any means. Um, but, like, you know, their approach to, especially since Trump has been in office, has been terrible to me. But, like, trying to give them the benefit of the doubt here for a second, they saw the abandonment of half the country from them. They went all resistance, and yes, they had good ratings during the Trump period, but as that faded away, ownership changes, they realized we've really hollowed out our audience. Now we can only do the MSNBC thing or nobody will watch. So I mean, in all appearances was they at least tried a little bit to try to make things more balanced. They've hired you know, some good conservatives that work there and appear very occasionally on the air. Right. But now, you know, you see that they're promoting Jim Acosta. Like, have they abandoned this? Because, I mean, it didn't seem to show anything in the ratings as far as growth. Yeah, I, I think that this is a really, it's a story that's just beginning because Chris Licht was brought in. Yeah. And, and I do think we saw this. You want a corollary to the, the, the uproar over Tucker Carlson daring to interview Vladimir Putin. What about during the Chris Licht era when they had a town hall? Caitlin Collins had a town hall with Donald Trump. And it didn't matter what the result of that was. It was certainly not an easy town hall. It was not like the softball interview. No. But just having it on caused such an internal uproar. It really yeah. was the end of, of, the, of Chris Licht's time there. I mean, it was it caused such uproar include, publicly. It played out publicly. People criticizing CNN within CNN for daring to have this town hall. How could you platform Donald Trump? I mean, it's insane. And so Chris Lick's gone. And now a new era is in there. Mark Thompson, who I've, I've heard is a fairly you know, benign journalist, essentially, a guy who's a you know, business guy from The New York Times. Mm -hmm. But one of his first moves when it comes to the actual kind of the public facing schedule is to install Jim Acosta, bring him from the wilderness on the weekends and give him a 10 a.m. We, a weekday show every single Monday through Friday, that's essentially a promotion. And Jim Acosta is really the last person standing of the, the hardcore anti-Trump resistance from the Jeff Zucker era. You've got mm. Brian Stelter, you've got Don Lemon, Chris right. Cuomo. He's the last one left at the network. And now he's getting promoted. What does that say? Either Mark Thompson doesn't know the kind of baggage that Jim Acosta has, or he doesn't care, or that's where the direction of the network is going as we enter the, the political season here. None of it's good. I, I think none of it's good for the long-term ability for CNN to reestablish some degree of trust with the average person in America. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm of the opinion it would be good if we had a reliable CNN. Yes. Like, I think that would actually be good for the country. Someone that wasn't, you know, Fox does their th some things well. Obviously, MSNBC serves their audience very well. But someone who could look at these things objectively 
and give me the news, you know, even if it was with a slight left lean, I could deal with that. Right. Uh, that doesn't, s- I hope that's not, they're totally not abandoning that vision. Um, let me go to uh, uh, John Stewart for a second. Yeah. You know, during the COVID era, John Stewart has this famous interview with, was it Colbert, where he comes out and talks <laughs> about the, the lab leak theory and yeah. just kind of states what I think everyone is thinking, right? Like, are we really going to believe this just popped up a, a couple blocks away from the one place in the world that they're they're you know researching this? And all he did was say something blatantly obvious. He doesn't have the scientific facts on it at all. Right. You know, who knows if he's right or wrong, but it was something that should have obviously been said, and it became very controversial. He starts uh, this show, I mean, I guess he has a show on Apple which doesn't seem to move the needle. Yeah. Um, gets, comes back to his old stomping ground over at The Daily Show one night a week. In his first monologue, where he just talks about, hey, I don't know if everyone's noticed, but both of these candidates are pretty old. Like, it's a kind of a situation, and Biden in particular, very old. Again, you're not allowed to say these things. The left loses their mind. The Biden administration loses their mind. They're criticizing even the New York Times coverage of right. Biden's age. I mean, they just want silence uh, if, the, if you will not toe the line. It was, this was fascinating to watch. John Stewart, who last hosted The Daily Show back in 2015, he left in August 2015, only two months after Donald Trump took that golden escalator oh, wow. ride and announced that he was running for, for president. So it was a completely different cultural media landscape when John Stewart was previously there. And look, John Stewart, I had criticisms of John Stewart as a Daily Show host, but he would occasionally poke at the people in power on his own side, on the left, yeah. even his own audience, and, say, and, and sort of call them out in a way. And he was essentially praised for it. But that's no longer allowed. I mean, the headlines from that monologue, Rolling Stone said it was a betrayal of the left that he dared to state the obvious. I mean, not, this is not a controversial opinion, saying that <laughs> Joe Biden is too old to be president. 86% of the people in America believe it, according to the ABC News poll, but he was pilloried for it. And he actually, uh, this week, when he was back on Monday, was kind of made a joke of it. Like, oh, wow, this is what the way things are now. Uh, and interestingly, he decided to go after Tucker Carlson for his entire monologue. That was a little safer. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. No, I, I think that John Stewart is about to learn a very interesting and difficult lesson about the current cultural and media landscape. It's very different than it was in 2015 when he left. And there is not an appetite for that from, from the people like John Stewart. No, no, it's too serious now. The democracy is at stake. We can't make jokes. We can't state the obvious about Joe Biden anymore. Yeah. It's amazing. It's like there's a value almost at this point in the media of grumpy old men who <laughs> like have had their career. They've made their money. They don't care. I mean, Ricky Gervais is this way. Like right. he, just, he doesn't yeah, care. Dave He's just going to be Dave Chappelle. Like they don't care anymore. They're just going to blurt it out. And I think it's the, thing, the one thing that can seemingly cut through. Um, Steve Krakauer, be sure to grab a, a copy of the book. It is great, and it's it, it has uh, interviews with people on the left and the right, everything behind the scenes. I mean, you have some admissions from people on the left in this book that I was like jaw-dropping as I was reading them. Thank you. It's definitely worth getting. It's out in paperback now. It's called Uncovered, How the Media Got Cozy with Power, Abandoned Its Principles, and Lost the People, which is out now in paperback. Steve, thanks so much for coming back on. Thanks, Stu. Appreciate it. Look, it's not the sexiest issue in the world, but I will say this Biden student loan relief thing is among the worst uh, uh, scandals of his administration. It's absolutely unbelievable. He's just trying to overturn our system of government by doing this. He himself said the Supreme Court blocked him and he did it anyway. He himself is saying this at this point. We have to do something about this. I mean, I, I feel like it's such a boring issue and a lot of people look at it as like, well, well, what's wrong with, you know, relieving some debt, even though, of course, they're the ones paying for it. Um, but like, I, you can't let this go. They're going to do this on 25 other issues if you just let this go. It, it, it's got to be stopped. I hope the Supreme Court takes it up again and smacks them down once again. Now, a, uh, this is sort of what's happening with the Second Amendment, which is in, in a good way. A judge has blocked California from suing makers of abnormally dangerous guns. Now, what does that mean exactly? I don't know. Guns are designed to actually be dangerous to whoever you're pointing them at and pulling the trigger. That's supposed to be, I mean, that's, that's actually the function of guns. That's, that's an intentional, it's a, it's a uh, you know, it's something, it's like a perk. You know, it's not, a, it's not, 
It's not supposed to be something that, you know, does nothing to the person you're shooting. It's supposed to actually do this. The question is, of course, who's pulling the trigger and what are they doing with the weapons? Uh, abnormally dangerous guns. I don't know exactly what that means. Maybe scary black ones. Usually that's what it is, like the scary black uh, AR-15 looking guns they say are abnormally dangerous. Of course, those are modern hunting rifles. This is not a surprise. It's They've been around for a very long time. And it's just realistically one of the most popular guns in America. So we'll see. Uh, right now, though, they cannot ban abnormally dangerous guns, even though, again, the Supreme Court has already made these rulings and they're just trying to overturn them over and over and over again. And we have a bill to allow abortions for children 12 and under, which has failed in Tennessee committee. Um, which is a good thing. We uh, this is uh, obviously like I mean, a scary, scary idea of, of of a young child having an abortion. You might think to yourself, "Well, gosh, someone under twelve having an abortion, um, you know, that's that's a crazy scenario." But I feel like you're understating it if you, if, if that's where your brain went. Because I will tell you this: in this world today, my brain immediately went to the. Are they going to try to abort a kid who's been born and is 12 years old? I think that might be the next pill. Like, they might be trying to actually abort living children that are 11 and a half. I, that's what I worry about. So if this is stopped, great. But, I mean, watch the other hand. You never know what they're going to try to pull next. When you absolutely positively have to buy or sell a home, you need a good real estate agent. Where do you find that person? Oh, you know, uh, on the bus bench. You know, if they put their face painted on a bus bench and like a homeless person gets up right at the right time and I happen to see uh, their face smiling back at me, that's who I'm going to have to sell my house. Uh, I mean, you can go that direction if you want. You can even go on a website and be like, oh, look, that's the house I want. Well, look, there's a real estate agent's name below it. That's what I should. You should have somebody on your side of every real estate transaction. So go to a different website. Go to realestateagentsitrust.com. Go there and find the best agent in your area. It's important. We're talking about your most you know, uh, important financial transaction. Uh, that's the way this works. And if you don't have somebody on your side, you could lose tens of thousands of dollars. I mean, it's that type of decision. And of course, it also could you could end up, I don't know, you, you think you got this beautiful house on this nice little cul-de-sac and then you realize like they're like grinding metals on the other side of your fence all night. You need to have the right house. You need to make sure every transaction goes the best way possible when you're talking about real estate. So go to realestateagentsitrust.com. The name kind of says it all. It's a free service to you, by the way. Realestateagentsitrust.com. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. Wow, uh, what a day. Um, this is just breaking. Uh, Biden is out. He is out of the White House. He, I don't know if he's been impeached or how this. That's, well, it's Commander Biden. Commander Biden is out of the White House. So he's been given away. <laughs> Poor Commander. Commander just, just Zoe drew blood from two dozen people. I mean, gosh, uh, what's the big deal? In fact, 24 incidents at least is what we're being told now with Commander Biden's dog, who just keeps biting people over and over and over again. I mean, just one of many, many scandals going on in the White House. I will say, I look forward to like the Ken Burns style documentary in the future where they can tell this stuff dispassionately. Because right now they want Joe Biden to win so badly, they won't tell you anything that's going on. But like, you know, 75 years from now, they'll run uh, something uh, from Ken Burns will probably still be alive making documentaries. And it will lead into the letters that may have gone back and forth between Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. And I, for one, cannot wait for that thing to make it to air. The following correspondence took place between President Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. and his son, Robert Hunter Biden, in the years preceding 2023. To my dearest son, Hunter, tis I, your father, leader of these grand colonies we call America. I believe I am writing this from my personal chambers in the White House, but I would need to seek confirmation of that fact from the good Dr. Jill. There are ever so many buildings and rooms in this fair city. Alas, the purpose of my writing today is thus. It would appear my enemies in the great Congress of these United States have stumbled upon some of our untoward business dealings in foreign lands. With this in mind, 
please attempt to keep the lowest of profiles as we weather the storms headed toward the Biden shores. I hope all is well, and we will speak again in the near future. Sent with love and honor, and a fair amount of confusion, Joe. P.S. My most loyal canine companion, Commander, attacked another one of my manservants today. In the corridors of the West Wing, his deeds hath left the path of blood and tendon. He has a ravenous appetite for human flesh. I heard the canine describe these desires with my own ears this past Tuesday at breakfast. He speaks perfect English and happens to love eggs, as well as human flesh. To my loving father, Joe, it is with great regret that I must inform you that staying out of the national spotlight may be a more difficult task than previously anticipated. You see, I have recently misplaced a personal computing device that contains an enormous amount of my personal possessions, such as financial records, business correspondence, and private photographs. If the rumors are to be believed, our family may experience a disconcerting situation similar to being bent over a moldy sofa and entered forcefully from the nether regions. Not unlike a recent encounter I experienced with a burlesque performer named Wendy inside her house on wheels. Respectfully and faithfully yours, Hunter. P.S. I write this letter to you whilst enjoying the great outdoors. Also, my c*** is out and currently exposed to the elements. To my troubled yet beloved son, my sincerest apologies on the release of your personal photographs. I do wish to inquire thusly. In the images of yourself and your presumably baking partner, where you are surrounded by piles and lines of flour, why did you find it necessary to remove all of your articles of clothing? Did the oven make the temperature untenable? Furthermore, I must express my discontent upon beholding your partaking in the burning leaf of tobacco. Though I toil with utmost vigor to vanquish the malady known as cancer, the remedy proves as perplexing to me as the confounding use of the three-pronged eating utensils provided by the White House kitchen. Blessings upon you, Joe. P.S. Stay strong, dear boy. And a reminder for your next visit, please stop exposing your c especially around Commander. Not a joke. Additional correspondence between Joe and Hunter Biden was uncovered and archived for future historical study. They were found near an antique Corvette amongst hundreds of boxes of classified presidential records. Look, there's some weird stuff going on in China. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm not happy about it. Um, you know, I I'm concerned. I I'm very concerned. They've had a new drink they've developed, and it's called the Abundant Year Savory Latte, or the Lucky Savory Latte. Cost uh, about $9.45. Um, and it's at Starbucks in uh, China. Did I mention it's pork flavored? Starbucks is introducing a new pork flavored latte. This is a pork flavored latte combining the pork flavor sauce with the typical dressing of a latte, espresso and steamed milk. Also will include extra pork sauce on top of the drink with a piece of pork breast meat skewered on top, dipping into the drink. Look at that thing. That is revolting in every single way possible. And I will say, people are like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if China really... Uh, is doing those crazy experiments people are accusing them of. Look at that drink. The last time they came up with an experiment like this, the world shut down for 18 months. I'm very scared. I'm very scared. By the way, State of the Race tomorrow morning on your audio feed. Go to the podcast app of your choice. St search for Studios America. You get the State of the Race podcast. Keeping you updated on all the world of politics and prepared for South Carolina.